Hey there. You can support Bonfireside Chat and other shows like it by going to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. Once again, that's patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. Thanks. Some of our landings were desperate adventures. We are now prepared to meet the inevitable counterattacks with power and with confidence. I no longer dream, but I was once a hunter too. There's nothing more horrific than a hunt. In case you fail to realize, the things you hunt, they're not beasts, they're people. One day you will see. My name is Gary Butterfield. My name is Cole Ross. And my name is Matt Lees. And you're listening to Bonfireside Chat. It is a hunter's favorite. Yes, and this week we are talking about Old Yarnum. And as you heard, uh, we are glad to be joined by Matt Lees um, of the Daft Souls podcast and also his uh, YouTube channel. Hey, Matt. Hello. Hey, Matt. Yeah. yeah. Pleasure. Nice yeah. to be here. Yeah, we're really happy to have you here. Yeah, yeah. I've been a big fan of the Souls series for a long time, really. Uh, I've been, I guess, I got into Dark Souls <laughs> and then went back to Demons and completed them both in my pants. Um <laughs> Not, not me, the character. Uh, that was a fun <laughs> thing I did back when I was at videogamer.com. A lot of people might have heard of it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, now I'm I'm kind of doing some stuff with Bloodborne, doing a little diaries thing where I still haven't finished the game, but I'm just going through very slowly, really enjoying my time with it and sort of uh, trying to piece together. It's kind of like a, 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 a turbo let's play. It's the idea of rather than sitting and watching 40 hours, I've turned about 40 hours into about an hour and 20 minutes or something and sort of condense it down to a little story sort of thing. That's wonderful. Not like, uh, that makes sound like I'm like Varty Vidya, but I'm not, I'm not like that. He's got a much, he's got a much better voice. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the kind of lore focused let's play thing that, uh, people do. I really like that. Um, you know, just kind of the highlights of the, of the gameplay mm, and, yeah. and the such, like one of the things I, I really, you know, I like, um, Epic name bro. Obviously, you know, I like that guy, but his let's plays are all in real time where he drops these really tantalizing, you know, bits of, uh, insight from working on the guide but you have to set through like a lot of just watching and play the game that i've already played <laughs> um so it's fun but it's also like i like a, a more focused approach um I, yeah i first uh so matt like for people who you know who may not know uh who are listening um Daf, the deaf souls uh podcast and then uh, i kind of came to you from these kind of long form uh, relatively long form for youtube uh critique videos oh, on yeah, YouTube. Yeah. just just kind of looking around for um getting into like errant signal and the like and uh looking around for you know just kind of people thoughtfully talking about games on youtube and uh and i i've been a fan ever since so it was really cool once i found out like hey you're also a big souls guy um you know to to kind of uh hit you up for this i'm really yeah. glad that you yeah it's weird i do a whole bunch of different things and people often like uh stumble into my work from really really different approaches um mm -hmm. sometimes they come in from like really pure old comedy side of things other times they come in from the more serious chin strokey stuff. Other times it's just <laughs> light fun nonsense. But uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Souls games are just fantastic. Really, it's uh, it they're really there's nothing else quite like them yet. Even though for the past few years we've seen lots of games coming like oh, it's like it's like Dark Souls. <laughs> no, yeah. it isn't. It isn't. There, there, uh, there's a there's a Twitter uh, out there that's like it's Dark Souls Four. <laughs> um, I think is what it's called, and it's literally it's just like every kind of experience, every kind of game. It's like it's the Dark Souls of. Um, is and it, just stretching the boundaries. Is it pulling from actual headline quotes, or is it just making stuff up for fun? It is. Uh, it is like a dot text thing. It is finding okay. people in forums and the like, <laughs> you nice. know, comparing uh, comparing things that are not very much like Dark Souls to yeah. being the Dark Souls of real life, or the Dark Souls of fast food, or the Dark Souls of you know chess maneuvers, or you know the Dark Souls of of what have you. Chipotle is like the Dark Souls. The Dark Souls of fast food. Yeah. Ugh, <laughs> man, that's. Hey, it isn't. It isn't. It's not a gazelle. No, it's, it's uh, yeah. It's. I think it's. It's just become one of those games that has become a cultural touchstone. Um, and I think that's really cool. But I think also because of that, it's. It's in the same way that we have movies that become cultural touchstones. They often get referenced in ways which just don't make sense. You know, where people want to reference them because they kind of go, oh, well, it's like it's like that, isn't it? Because they know it's kind of an important cultural thing. Yeah. But often people don't really understand why. Um, and I think that's why I'm fascinated with Dark Souls is because it's like some of the best games I've ever played, but in many regards, it's a bit rubbish. And so <laughs> it's like trying to dissect that and trying to work out why. And I, I, that's kind of why I enjoy. I mean, I continue playing the games because I enjoy them. But mm -hmm. um, also, like, I just I'm fascinated with just sort of trying to work out what makes them tick, trying to work out what the essence of these things are. 
and uh, and what what they kind of bring to the the table of the medium really. Because but I think there are still tons of people who just go, "Oh, this game's really hard." It's like Dark Souls. <laughs> and it's like no, that's not it at all. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's the weird uh, badge of honor crowd, like the people who Ugh. just uh, you know just play through the game. And they're like, "This is really hard." I'm I am man, and then <laughs> and then kind of move on with their madness, and then uh, never uh, examine it at all absolutely i find it yeah it's almost like because of those people i haven't really wanted to say it but bloodborne's not actually very difficult (laughs) and it's like but the problem is there are so many people who say that who are just awful idiots um (laughs) i I don't want to say it because it's like i know that people are struggling with it and some people find it difficult and so because of this reaction of when people go oh it's quite hard and everyone goes no it isn't it's not difficult at all it's very easy it's just like, I don't want to be one of those people. Mm. So I'm just keeping stum. <laughs> You're talking to the right couple of guys about yeah. hesitancy of about saying controversial things about Souls games because <laughs> of the reaction of uh, reaction of, of the community. Yeah, so that, is a, that is a pain we know all too well. <laughs> um, but I mean, most people are wonderful. The uh, yeah, so the uh, so again, very glad to have you. And uh, and the, you know, specifically for this area, which is cool because it is uh, self-contained, as Cole mentioned. Uh, but before we get on to Old Yarnum, do you want to say what we did uh, last episode, Cole? Yeah. So previously, we finished up our coverage of Central Yarnum uh, by defeating Father Gascoigne in the tomb of Urden beneath the Grand Cathedral, and now uh, ascending into the Cathedral Ward, we are drawn to a sealed-off portion of Yarnum. Yeah, and it should be noted you don't have to do this yet. Right. Um, you can continue on, but uh, difficulty-wise, I think this makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. Um, even though this whole area is optional, yep. which uh, I, I had no idea. Like just playing into that theme, like I did not realize so much of the early game was going to be optional mm-hmm. in uh, in Bloodborne. You don't you don't have to go here. Yeah, I've really found that I haven't finished the game yet. Um, but I, even I found like I've been really unclear so far on <laughs> what's been optional and what hasn't. And it's funny how lots of people said to me, oh, I'm really stuck. It's like, with this game in particular, I found that it seems to be constantly offering me like three things to do. Mm -hmm. And I've I've never got stuck. I've always just like, as soon as I've hit a wall, I've gone, you know, I'm just going to go do something else for a bit. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I've never been sure which is the right way. And I'm just like, what what, what am I doing? Like, Mm -hmm. only really recently have I done something. I thought, okay, that's probably something I had to do to continue the story. But mostly I'm just like, Am I just killing stuff? <laughs> like, <laughs> no. That's fine. Yeah, especially at this juncture, too, with the Cathedral Ward hitting right there, there are definitely three different ways you can go, um, including deeper into the ward itself. And I didn't realize that Old Yarnum was a thing until until I had banged my head against some of the kind of upcoming episodes bosses for a little while and then decided to just kind of run in a different direction. So this wasn't yeah. the first place that I went. It, you, you run into those meat walls, yeah. you know, which is, which is so wonderful, like the graveyard in, in Dark Souls, mm-hmm. kind of similar similar thing. Um, which is also what happened to me, and then eventually I was like, oh, "Okay, I'll, I'll I'll go back here." But there's so little signaling about the entrance to this, um, you know, where you have to come in through the uh, the cathedral ward, and uh, it's just kind of this little side passage. It's fairly easy to miss mm-hmm. if you're if you're not looking through. Yeah. Um, so, so Old Arnhem, in kind of a, a nutshell, is uh, this is a, a part of the city, kind of a, a part of the city that was warded off, where there's this ashen blood blood plague. Um, is thought to have begun, and uh, it's walled off from the rest of the city. It was burned, <laughs> you know, burned down more or less. And beasts are left down here to starve. It is this quarantine zone, mm-hmm. and so this is a little bit thematically like New Londo, right? Mm-hmm. Insofar as the, it is a place of evil that was, you know, sealed away in this human rights atrocity, or you know, what passes for one in Yarnum. Um, and uh, it's got a little bit of a touch of, uh, like, let's say, like Bl- Blight Town or, or uh, World Five, right? Because this plague has made everything just a little bit poisonous. Like, this is kind of mixing and matching some stuff about uh, uh, things that we've seen before. It, it's also a little bit like um, Demon Souls World Five because it has this kind of patron saint, mm-hmm. you know, this kind of patron caretaker to it, uh, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, the kind of thesis that we've come for this area, um, you know, Cole has provided two different versions. <laughs> uh, one, you know, the hunter becomes the hunted, which uh, this is, I mean, it, it's actually pretty, said it's like, yeah. it, it's a line of dialogue in this area. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then also you're dealing with kind of threats from above and below that change the rhythm of play. I would also say that this is um, a weird section where a souls game for a portion becomes kind of like a cover base, yeah. you know, set piece from an FPS which is very weird. I remember excitedly texting you about this yeah. <laughs> when I got to it. Yeah. Um, you know, and that and that's a little bit like um the Dragon God too. Mm-hmm. Um this kind of moving from cover piece to cover piece. Something you don't usually do. Mm-hmm. Souls game. Yeah. Oh. 
So uh, you don't get to Old Yarnum like right away. We have to dip a little bit into the uh, Cathedral Ward to set this up. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. so we get that when we just we left off in the Cathedral Ward, you get this little cinematic that's just you walking in, mm-hmm. uh, which reveals an NPC uh, there who we're going to talk about more next episode. Yep. when we spend a lot of time in the cathedral ward. Yeah. Um, and I am also, uh, you know, so this is the Erden Chapel dweller. Mm-hmm. Um, I am embarrassed to say that I missed this guy for a long time, <laughs> despite him being in the uh, the cinematic. He looks like he's uh, part of the, go, go ahead. Yeah. He does, I mean, it does look like scenery to a degree, but it moves. <laughs> scenery that moves is always, I don't, I don't see how you could have, I mean, I'm always on so edge with these games. That, mm-hmm. Like anything that moves, I'm just like, kill it. I mean, I didn't I, kill it, <laughs> but... <laughs> The idea that you could just run past something, and I, I know, no, I'd never do that. I'd just be like, what is it? Kill it. It's not a battle. Murder it. Um, I was thinking of him in terms of, like, Flory from the, the Pee-wee, Pee-wee's uh, Playhouse <laughs> as just this kind of, like, grimacing section of the floor that kind of just shudders and, and moves and, and, and pulses. He got fused and unsettling into it. rhythms. But I think that what happens is after the... If you don't notice him in the cutscene because he's just there for a second, you kind of start off... Um, uh, right next to him with him in, to your right. Mm-hmm. So if you don't immediately look to your right after the cutscene, I just walked forward and that was how I missed him. Um, came to him later. He is gross. He, it's a really terrifying thing, yeah. And it's one, I mean, it's not a spoiler because I genuinely don't know what happens with this character. I haven't got that far. Um, but I just love the fact that it's a character who just seems to be very, seems to be really friendly and yet looks like horrifying <laughs> and is, is trying to encourage you to help him out by doing something. And you're like, yeah. well, yeah, but... You look like a monster. And you and, sound shifty. But then you have the classic thing in Souls games of the, one of the, the classic themes tends to be this idea of actually when you meet characters who appear to be pure and clean and good, they're actually really not. They're really mm-hmm. evil. And this idea, but then I, then you kind of go, yeah, but does it stretch back the other way that when mm-hmm. you meet things that look horrible, they might be nice? And often it's like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes <laughs> yurt is yurt. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, but... Like, you want to keep an open mind. You really want to be like, no, I shouldn't judge you just because you look like you're a melted person. Just because you're part, part of the floor, just because you look like a spent candle. Yeah, yeah. like you might be all right. <laughs> Jimmy yeah. Candleman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something I love about like that, that that put me on edge when walking into this area um, is the is the close up shots of these alien looking statues. Oh yeah, they kind of have a, like a little bit of the multi eyed peanut face happening. Uh, and this is the first yeah. time we've really seen that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. that's going to be a big thing yeah. that we're going to keep uh, keep seeing, and we're going to figure out what uh, what old peanut face <laughs> peanut face is eventually. Yeah, um, which is cool. Mm-hmm. So something that happens when you walk into this area for the first time is the moon phase changes. Right now it is early evening in Yarnum, right? Mm. So you have these different time zones that kind of ratchet the the, the story forward a bit. Uh, we alluded to this before, but uh, there are story events that will kind of move everything forward and change NPC events. And also change the appearance of uh, previous areas as well. Like if you go back to Central Yarnum now, um, the sky will be very uh, uh, a different color, and the light, the quality of light, the light will have changed. You know, I, this is gonna, this is possibly profoundly ignorant of me, and I, I'm, you know, forgive me if I, if I forgot. Um, for some reason, I thought this didn't happen until you beat the boss of this area. Nope. Okay. Yeah, it's, walk, it's walking. I'm just, into I'm just this area. giving giving you. A, I'm just testing you a little mm-hmm. bit, making sure you're sure, and I'll, I'll believe you, but I just want to make mm-hmm. sure you're sure. Yep. Because uh, I really thought it was after you take out the the vicar. Nope. I um, thought it was that okay. as well. But, uh, the, the, there yeah. is there is a change after you defeat the vicar. Um, okay, but, but there's uh, another change here as well. Yeah, this one's a little bit more subtle than the vicar change. Okay, I will I will trust you. Yep. Um, yeah, and mm-hmm. also German shows back up in the hunter's dream. Um, do not pay attention. I, I was in a hurry when I made these notes, so he's not talking about the tomb of the gods. Um, uh, <laughs> who's, who are the gods? Yeah. What lore revelation is this? Goal? Yeah, H T E G O T S. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, he gives you a little bit of a little bit of a push in the direction towards uh, Old Yarn. I'm talking about the the, the chalices um, that uh, kind of uh, you know get more powerful when the when the moon looms large and the beasts are about and uh, talking about the tomb of the gods beneath Yarnum and the few that made their way to the surface um, resting in these places such as this valley of a sealed off hamlet right so it's kind of pointing you uh, to go downward and and when we say German is back if he disappears for you and you haven't smacked him mm-hmm. go look behind the workshop because that's likely where he's at yeah. and you get you can see kind of a cool thing that can happen you get a can get a little neat bit of dialogue hmm. there so he's usually back there sleeping and or mourning. 
Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when he starts talking about, uh, when we talk about the character that he's talking about. Mm -hmm. There. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about more about this area next episode. So let's get into uh, into Old Yarnum. Um, Matt, did you have an, uh, did you end up going here? You said you, you came here a little bit later. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, your first impressions when you first kind of came down here? Old Yarnum? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I really love the way that some of the areas in this game are kind of heralded with quite showy entrances. You know, you know, you unlock ancient doors and you have all these big things. But then every now and then you have these uh, these senses of you just feel like you're off exploring and you have these moments where you are doing what you would do in an RPG usually is go and find a chest, you know? You just mm -hmm. go, oh, what's down this little thing? What's down this little corridor? And then you just end up finding something amazing. And this was one of those cases, the fact, you know, you go to church, you find a secret passage <laughs> underneath and then at the bottom of the secret passage, there's passages, there's some cool statues and then you think, oh, that's it. There's some treasure down here. Cool, that's it. And then I noticed another tiny door to the side of the room and I thought, oh, I wonder what's down that door. And then went down and I was like, oh, a werewolf jumped out at me in the dark and had a fight with a werewolf. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then got to the end of that and I thought, oh, cool, there's another, like, there's a lamp here. So I can basically, there's a shortcut back. And I thought, I might have some treasure in this room. And I thought, no, there isn't, there's a door. And I opened that door and then it's just suddenly this huge, you're just outside, there's a huge new bit. And I just loved it. It just completely blindsided me in the fact that it's like, wow, I've just found another whole area. Like, I was, and Level's <laughs> done that to me quite a lot, just being like, you just found another whole area when I was expecting. A dead end or like a little treasure chest um we, i love how it's kept me kept me guessing yeah, yeah but, the, um, we, we've talked a lot on the show about the kind of dopamine squirt you get from the new area noise <laughs> in, a, in a souls game that that specific tone that comes when a title card comes up i don't um, know I, th I don't even think actually it's like sometimes it's nice but other times i don't like it other times because <laughs> i suppose in this game i've been multitasking so much i've been like <laughs> When I discover a new area, I always think, oh, it makes me feel bad because I think there's all these other areas I haven't done yet. I shouldn't have found another <laughs> one yet. Yeah. I'm just there looking for, like, I don't know, some cool treasure or something. I don't know what I'm looking for. But um, this area is pretty one of my favorite reveals in the game just because you come through this this half a jar door outward and you just hear this distant voice basically just saying, don't come yeah. any closer. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Yep. And yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't. It worked. It was this thing of like, <laughs> I couldn't see who was shouting it, and I could see lots of werewolves had been strung up to crosses and set on fire, and this character was saying, stay there, don't come any closer. And I just thought, you know what? Cool. Fine. <laughs> and I just wandered off and did loads of other stuff. Not that much other stuff. I did some other stuff until I eventually came back, just because it, it freaked me out. It was one of the many multitudes of ways that, that uh, Bloodborne has freaked me out, not being able to see who was shouting at me and not knowing what would happen if I didn't. It took me a while, actually, when I actually left. I, I didn't, I pressed forward very slowly because I was expecting something to happen, like, mm. a lot earlier than it actually did. But it was great. That tension really kept me kind of on my toes. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, like, some of it also comes from how you actually get here. Yeah. Um, we talked about real quick like, about going through that church, but this whole run-up is, uh, is really cool, this whole, like, down, down, down <laughs> feeling of sneaking through this little side church. Yeah. Here, this chapel. And normally this kind of this kind of structure in a game like this is is the end itself. Right. You don't expect to, you know, venture into the basement of a place like this and have it open up to something to something else. And so that does two things. It makes you think, OK, they really don't want us to be here. But also it gives you kind of that uncanny feeling of kind of like pushing past the bottom and having it open up. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Get to the basement and get out a shovel. Um, <laughs> on your on your way here, when you, you introduced or you're introduced to this, one of my favorite just kind of common enemies in the game are these uh, church attendants, mm -hmm. um, who are these unnaturally tall guys with hats <laughs> who do the the point from they live or from uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think these guys win my most fun to parry award. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the entire game, like you, can, I can parry these guys all day long, and it's always fun and satisfying to do. No matter what weapon they're using, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of what their faces remind me of, and I, I might just be reacting to the fact that they're so much more articulated than the, mm -hmm. uh, the than other enemy faces are, um, mm -hmm. and they're and they're so like kind of held in this rictus, right? Yeah, they're, they're more articulated than like actual NPCs and cutscenes. Yep, and and people you run into, like their faces are actually move where faces don't always do that in this game like they're humanoid but they they uh and and they they have that kind of like mannequin uh like whack like they look like a wax sculpture <laughs> of a face you know it's like just subtly off in color and just moves in a weird way um these guys are really great yeah 
Um, I would like an action figure of them as well. And what's awesome about these guys is they change with uh, with insight. If you uh, mm-hmm. the, the figure that I saw in a couple of places, so I feel confident saying this number. If you have over fifteen, uh, then they will uh, then they will uh, vary up their move set depending on the uh, the weapon they carry, and also their appearance changes a little bit as well. In in really unnerving ways, yep. uh, because the the scythe guy just gets a magic scythe, which like fine. Lamp guy's lamp is now covered with eyeballs <laughs> and shoots magic missiles at you. Um, which is pretty effed up. Mm-hmm. And you, you can you can have yeah. fifteen insight by this point. It's kind of difficult, but if you're sucking down Madman's knowledge um, around this point, or when you start actually exploring the the ward for real, mm-hmm. you can get up there. Yeah, it happened to me pretty much. Like, I hadn't been in the ward very long, and it really freaked me out because suddenly <laughs> it was just these enemies were just different. They were just doing different things, and I had. I mean, I, I tried to you know keep my run quite clean in terms of not knowing what was going on, and it, it, that just like really threw me because I was just. I was kind of cool with these guys. I could kill them. I could fight them. It was not a problem. And then suddenly, just like out of nowhere, for seemingly no reason, they just <laughs> were more dangerous and had new moves. And I was like, what? Like, mm-hmm. well, it's like, what have I done? What happened? That, and, that, uh, yeah. It kind of undermines a basic soul's assumption, right? Like as we go through these areas, again, mastery and knowledge compresses space. And you think, okay, I know exactly what these guys are going to do because they pretty much never change. And when they when yeah. they pull that rug out from under you, you know, they don't do it very much, like in the like in the broader scheme of things. But even just doing it in this instance makes the game feel much more big and mysterious than it ought to be. And it, oh, yeah. and, and it makes you, it puts you more on edge, even going back through places that you otherwise would have thought, you know, in a previous game that you kind of had down. Yeah. And it, it lends a lot of uh, weight to insight mm-hmm. as a mechanic, which is already really, really neat when, when I think it's, you know, when it's used well, it's used really, really well. And, uh, and I still want, I would want more, you know, from that. Like I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of this kind of enemy change behavior based on insight. I think that's a really neat idea. Mm-hmm. Um, in this little uh, kind of mini cathedral, we also meet a really pretty important NPC um, here around back. Um, you had through and you meet uh, Alfred. Yes, he is dressed all in white, and he is kind of kneeling and worshiping at this altar that uh, has an amazing-looking statue over it. It has kind of this geometric shroud over it, which mm-hmm. makes him cut kind of a similar, at least, uh, uh, frontal appearance to Pyramid Head a little mm-hmm. bit. Maybe I just see pyramid heads everywhere I look because of who I am. (laughs) But um, the fact that he is there and you see all these like offerings and these bloody shrouds next to this uh, uh, kind of leads you to question, you know, uh, what's this guy all about? Yeah. And it turns out that he is a relatively solid bro. Mm -hmm. Um, However, um, he gives you, uh, you know, he talks about uh, cooperation. He kind of sets himself up, sets himself up as the Solaire of this (laughs) game a little bit. Um, But interestingly, rather than just being like, hey, you can summon me. He actually says, like, hey, we should share knowledge, um, which we there's never been like an ask about function yeah. in the Souls game. But this guy actually gives you a menu like, hey, we should, you know, tell me about tell me about this stuff. I want to know the mysteries of this as well, mm-hmm. um, which is really neat. Um, we find out that he is a, he's a protege of Logarius and uh, they hunt the vile bloods. Um, <laughs> we don't really know who those guys are exactly yet, mm-hmm. uh, but we will. Yeah. And I love that this is dropped because by the time, you know, you, you, you talk to this guy and you hear vile, vile bloods, you file that away in your Rolodex. By the time you encounter, you know, the kind of the remnants of this, uh, I kind of forgot about it. And so going back through this time uh, and, and recognizing and realizing that, oh, this guy is connected to this was a huge moment for me. Yeah, it's super neat. Yeah. He, he also gives you some item, like an item that's really useful in this next area, which yeah. is this fire paper. Um, which can, you know, can fire up your weapon. Um, he lets you know about the, uh, the healing church, um, you know, talks about this holy medium uh, blood, you know, being venerated in the main cathedral. Um, and he talks about Bergenworth and gives a little bit of history of the college. Um, and it turns out that Bergenworth, they found a tomb of the gods under Yarnum. And uh, there they found this holy medium and established the church. Yeah. This so deftly brings in some disparate elements. Like, there, the, you know, the, the, there are people who say, like, oh, the, 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 the chalice dungeons are not linked into the main story. Well, that's what that is. Yeah. Is the tomb yeah. of the gods. Like, they, they are, but it's also, like, you have to spend so much more gameplay time to lore ratio mm-hmm. is so huge. Like you spend a lot of time exploring to get little nuggets mm-hmm. of of actual story advancement in the Chalice Dungeons that like they I feel like they exist in some kind of weird limbo between mm-hmm. main you know game and side game. Yeah, yeah. You I know? feel very I have really mixed feelings towards the Chalice Dungeons. Um, it just it's a really weird mechanic. I kind of it, it serves a role, um, but I don't know how 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 kind of 
neat it is in a way. It's kind of it's basically not it's the for people who are struggling really, it seems to be that it's like if you really hit a wall then you just can go and do some of these things and you'll get some gems which will make you quite a lot more powerful. Um, and it kind of gates you from doing that by then ensuring that in your first run through anyway, like the amount of materials that you get throughout the run is like quite controlled. So you can't just abuse these uh, these places in terms of like playing stuff again and again and again to get really good items. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know, like encouraging people to go and like grind yeah. in these because they're not good. And actually, it's probably the harshest disc for the previous, for From Software's <laughs> previous game. But the... Um, the Chalice Dungeons just remind me of Dark Souls 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is really like the fact that, you know, Dark Souls 2 is a crafted game felt like a kind of procedurally generated thing. It's like, mm. oh, that's pretty harsh. But yeah. it's just, I don't know, it doesn't, it's not quite. It, but it's nice, the, it is nice that it's tied in, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, I, I, I partly agree with you. Like it, the, the ties are, you know, are slightly more tenuous or just you have to work harder for them. Um, I will also say, as in the spirit of full disclosure, that we both, Cole and I both really like Dark Souls too. So if you need to leave now, um, I understand. <laughs> no, I, 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 I like Dark Souls too a lot. It just it was not like a patch on Dark Souls. Yeah, I think yeah, I, and I, I think that I think that time will will prove that to be right. There, there's there still things I really, really like about it, but I, mm-hmm. I think oh, the yeah, Dark Souls yeah. one is still, you know, still some, probably top of the pops. Yep, had some awesome stuff in it. It really did. <laughs> like some of the stuff in that game was was incredible, but, but uh, it was also really rubbish. <laughs> your, your point that like it wasn't some of the the levels weren't as thoughtfully laid out and the parts in the chalice dungeon that are procedurally generated kind of evoke that feel i would mm-hmm. agree with yeah um you know and that's kind of the the part the reason why the chalice dungeons while being really cool i like them most when i think of them as bonuses because mm-hmm. you're Absolutely. not going to get that same level layout and you're not going to get these little cool world building details with the same frequency Absolutely. as you do in the main game I actually go to the Chalice Dungeons and play them when I'm in a mood where I want to play Dark. I want to play Bloodborne, but I almost don't want to have like experiences in the game. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. I kind of feel like I'm not in the right mindset like, to enjoy it my best. Mm-hmm. So I kind of think I want to play Bloodborne, but actually I don't feel like I'm going to really like enjoy it. So I go and do some dungeons, and it means I'm not going to spoil any of the game for myself. It's like, like running sloppy. a drill. It is. Mm-hmm. It is. Um, and yeah, it's it's not it's not bad by any means, but I think if anything, actually, it's just like the. Um, the Chalice Dungeons are just like it. They remind me how good Bloodborne is in a way. When I'm playing the Chalice Dungeons, I just go, yeah, like <laughs> these are not as good as the main game. And it reminds me of all the reasons why, like Bloodborne is is really, really something quite special. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we agree there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, oh. really, all I was saying there was uh, was that this is uh, the, the, them foreshadowing this Tomb of the, uh, the the Tomb of the Gods. I really love the way that that plays into kind of the Lovecraft side of this that they unearthed something horrible that led to the that led to the. Uh, um, events that you see here um, mm-hmm. and we're still relatively early on we don't know really the full implications of what he's talking about but the fact that he's setting this stuff up to pay off later um, right now if you're paying attention I think is uh, is incredibly effective yeah I would, I would agree with that um, we're going to run into this guy more and he has his own kind of NPC storyline mm-hmm. that we'll cover uh, over the course of the next year or so. <laughs> um, so so after you go through the basement of this church you actually get into Old Yarnum um here and uh, we had that sign that we mentioned you know you're not welcome here and when you first get out here and you're you're just exposed to this whole new area um which is really cool this like new color palette which is nice because you know victorian buildings <laughs> at this point i was a little bit sick of of walking around them and uh this this huge sky full of smoke which I, which i really love like like this is an area that is you know like i said it has been burned down and uh in the the souls part of me was just like what happened here <laughs> you know like what how am i going to reverse you know, kind of tell the story and do the archaeology um, and figure out uh, what disaster befell this little micro, you know, microcosm. Yeah. The uh, the sound here is delightful as well. Like the like because everything is so silent, aside from this ambient sound of kind of like a far off fires rumbling, the fact that you can hear these uh, the, these patient beasts um, kind, of, kind of moving around and skittering behind the smoke that definitely like the, the smoke that affects your gameplay is coming from burning bodies. Like you see the limbs and stuff shriveled up as a, as as it comes along. Um, this is incredibly atmospheric as you're kind of under this like almost alienly yellow sky. Yeah. Very cool. This was the this is actually the first point in the game where I started playing with headphones because I've met <laughs> a couple of people in pubs who said you've got to play with headphones <laughs> and um, you you've got to play with headphones. <laughs> uh, I, I, I you know lucky I've, I've still got a, a pair, an old pair of Astros uh, which I've had for many years now. It work well. Just having some really nice quality 
like surround sound headphones just makes Bloodborne just unbelievably atmospheric and intense. And in this area in particular, I was just, it was just blowing my mind. The sound design is just so good. The fact that you can just hear these very, very subtle things, the, the kind of like, you know, just in this area, you can hear like wolves just like screaming in the distance. Like, and they just, they're so tiny, such microscopic little noises that if you weren't playing with headphones, you just wouldn't hear them. Absolutely, and even playing with uh, with like a, like a full surround with like a, with with a, with a subwoofer, I felt bad for my downstairs neighbor because that rumble is so omnipresent. But like that provides like a great separation between the you know the like the like the low frequency that's there and then that kind of high frequency stuff that's just kind of hitting the speakers all around you. Yeah, that screeches. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's a lot like this game reminds me a lot of Resident Evil Four, and this is one of the areas that was reminding me of that again. Um, but I guess particularly because it's, you know, as we get to doing the whole, like, the whole, like, it's war style hiding behind stuff, the guns, it feels a bit more action game, but, uh, yeah, like, just, it just not really even frightening, just oppressive, like, just mm-hmm. consistently oppressive tone and just using, um, everything. And in this, in this case in particular, it was when it really started using audio in a way to just make you feel unnerved. And the fact that you have got this omnipresent roar of the fires, but then you've got, the surround and you've got as you say the sound of skittering behind the smoke and the fact that the the enemies you're fighting are often like very well disguised into the environment that you can to begin with walk past them without even noticing their enemies there <laughs> and having this mad paranoia of if uh, did i hear something behind me and it's like it, it's the, the fact that the sound of the things moving is not that dissimilar to the sounds of the fire it's just starts to really kind of get into your head with just the paranoia um of of understanding stuff and also like the fact that the, the game has sound effects in the background which are just sort of there and are nothing <laughs> and it's just mm. messing with you and yeah unpleasant but in a really really <laughs> good way <laughs> i love that yeah uh to, you know towards a purpose mm-hmm. unpleasant towards a towards a purpose the um right. so you we, we've been shouted at by by jura and uh and and he you know he says didn't you see the warning uh old yarn yarnum is burned and abandoned by men and is now home only home to beast uh these beasts are no harm to those above yeah um so that's like kind of a twist even though it does have a little bit of that priscilla thing where it's like he's saying you know these creatures are peaceful this land is is wonderful (laughs) but you're still getting people up in your grill Mm -hmm. trying to kill you for being here yeah it's more of like they don't know any better right like he is he is there to protect them and it's almost like a hasn't the church done enough by yeah. kind of um, instigating and then kind of ensure instigating the downfall of this part of the city and then ensuring that nobody could escape. Like, duh, they're not a, they're, they're not a threat to you above because you have made sure of that. Yeah, that, that, exactly. that nobody could get any help. You win. You won. Mm-hmm. Um, church. If, if so, you can head over to the right a little bit and do some some rooftop dropping. Um, <laughs> it's only really uh, notable um, because you can get the hunter's torch, mm-hmm. which is a lot better than your regular torch, especially if you're doing an arcane build. Yeah. Um, torches uh, damage scale with arcane and versus beast this is actually kind of a potent weapon yeah. if you're doing an arcane build especially yeah. here because there are two kinds of like regular enemies that you're going to find which uh, i was very surprised when i was like doing reading about this matt i'd be curious to, to to know if you came across this organically the fact that the female ones have shrouds and will not react negatively to fire but the male ones the ones in bandages actually will kind of cower like the uh, like the uh, uh, the wharf monsters from dark souls 2 did you come across that I didn't even spot the genders, but I did notice that. I did notice there was a difference. You, you, you didn't flip up their skirts? Yeah. You didn't, you didn't check under the hood? Yeah, you didn't do the old carriage like, check? Not that, kind of, not that kind of gentleman. Uh, I don't like to ask a wolf's age. Um, no, but yeah, I did notice that some of them are afraid of the fire. And actually, um, you say, you know, the Hunter's Torch is good for an arcane build, but actually, to be honest, the Hunter's Torch is just good for this part of the game. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I didn't bother with that kind of build, but... I really love the fact that this area, especially, you know, towards the end of it, when you're kind of indoors a lot more. Actually, no, in the early sections of it as well, like, you're often indoors. Mm-hmm. And I love the mechanic of the fact that not only does it force you to, to run and dash to avoid the gunfire, but it also it, it, it forces you into buildings in a way which you're not often comfortable with. In the way that usually you want to run into a building, or step into a building quite cautiously, but you need to escape from, mm-hmm. from a barrage of fire. So you just run in, and then you run in, and you don't know what's in there. And then it's dark, and then it's werewolves in there. So I really like the way it all plays together, um, and I love that the you know the lighting engine in, in this section with this torch looks just incredible. And you're fighting these cowled creatures that are purposefully designed to be covered with these kind of cloth um, head like you know, like 
like draped in cloths basically but it's the same cloths which the statues are draped in so it's this thing of you know mm-hmm. the way the light flickers off them is really similar to the way the light flickers off the statues and it's just there's so much really clever stuff going on all at once um but even just fighting them with the fire is great it's not just that you've got it there for light it's also like it does quite good damage because i don't know how yeah. you guys feel about the whole like um for, for my money like bloodborne is great but it's only really great for one play style in my mind there's just mm-hmm. not enough there in terms of the magic stuff and in terms of the arcane stuff and the blood tinge stuff to make it really worth like specialist builds in the same way you would have done in the previous games uh, we we feel very strongly about that um <laughs> we do we talked about it a lot i think that the the lack of build variety um or one i would say the build variety is one of dark souls 2's greatest strengths mm-hmm. it's one Absolutely. of the things that game really did well and uh, the lack of build variety in bloodborne is a travesty <laughs> um it's a, it's a real disappointment for me like it is hard for me to see myself replaying this, you know, and having that different verb set with the same degree. I think if you're being extremely charitable, I can only really think of four different builds mm-hmm. uh, for the game, which is significantly less than, than a lot of the games in the past. Oh, sure, and, sure. and of those, like, like blood tinge isn't really viable for a long time. Arcane is no. not viable for a long time. Um, even when you start getting arcane spells, you get movement and and utility spells before you get anything that you can actually use as a weapon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like the game wants you to play in a certain way. Um, yeah, one of, you know, one of two ways it feels like a little bit. I don't really mind that because it's like, it's one of those things where I guess because um, I've always loved the Souls games, but I've never really like, I've never been one for replay value. I guess because, you know, part of what I do is I play a lot of games, I cover a lot of games. So I don't, I don't actually have time to just keep replaying stuff over and over again. Um, I get why they did it in Bloodborne. It's like they just had a really, really... Because, you know, the combat system in Bloodborne, when you're just doing the thing it wants you to do, is so good. Mm -hmm. And it's so much better than anything they've ever done before. But I think they must have just looked at it and gone, we can't make, like, everything this good. Like So I think they just had to trim it back and be like, all right, well, we're not going to. We're just going to make this really good. And I'm kind of glad they did because they've made something excellent. But it's something that doesn't have replay value. But it's weird. They've still got all these spells and these, (laughs) like... They give you a hunter's torch, which is scaled to this. It's like, why are you encouraging players to like spec up in this stuff when you're not going to give them any toys to play with? Like, it's not yeah. cool. So I, I agree, it's annoying, but um, yeah. but yeah, it's it's frustrating because in previous games you could kind of accidentally stumble your way into a minimally minimally viable build yeah. or some of those other ways just by kind of following the stat requirements, right? And because yeah. they dole out the things that will benefit from uh, investing in Blood Tinge and in Arcane so slowly and so and so late into the game, actually seeing those and seeing what the stat requirements are and recognizing, hey, there's a use for this, um, you know, by, by that point, they're so expensive that it becomes like just not really worth making that kind of investment or it makes it very hard to justify, you know, a radical change in your build. And so what happens is it says, okay, this is going to be something you do on a later playthrough, um, specifically sacrificing your ability to perform well in the early game so that you're going to be able to actually use this stuff later on and, yeah, that's, but, not, that's not fun is it <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not very fun and then also when i did that to do the arcane build it was not as fun right as uh the actual just strength build yep and the the problem is we've, got, we've got yeah. so few like actual yeah so few things mm-hmm. but the problem mm-hmm. is because there were way more like weapons and way more spells and stuff in the early games even if you got to one thing and thought, well, that's a bit crap, you still have loads of other stuff where it's like you could level up. And actually a friend of mine, like uh, Quinn Smith, he leveled up like arcane loads because he wanted to use this weapon and the weapon was just crap. And because there's mm-hmm. so few weapons, it's just like, oh, that <laughs> yeah. was a waste it, of like all of that time. Like, um, it, it, it also has like huge storytelling implications. Like yeah. there's just fewer opportunities to explicitly have text and then also have storytelling through like finding things in the environment. You know, like you find a piece of armor here and maybe that's significant. Like this person who wore it was somebody and that doesn't happen as often in this game, I find. I will be very curious to see if this is addressed or, you know, kind of uh, ameliorated with with the expansion that was just announced today. Yeah, I'm I'm very curious as to what they're going to do with that. I wouldn't be surprised. I really wouldn't be surprised because I think the impression I get is that they had the framework in there for these different types of builds, but then they didn't. They just decided to focus on, on getting that core like hack and slash speed attack or strength just that and just nail that and then everything else just felt really really poorly fleshed out to the point of not being finished but um so i wouldn't be surprised if really if for a game like this i wouldn't be surprised if actually as part of the expansion they put in more infrastructure so it's like actually adding replay value to the game in mm-hmm. addition to adding new content like of actually fleshing those things out and maybe they just 
they didn't want to because I mean, it would have been a real drag actually if they yeah. made it so that like the combat is as good as it is now but then you've also got other types of things and it's just a bit rubbish like yeah. it it would have been really disappointing so i kind mm. of get it why they focus but yeah it is it's it, to be honest it would have been better if they had just like not bothered with stats like arcane and blood tinge it just felt like you shouldn't have put them in you should have just left that out you should have left the spells out because it's like it's not substantial enough to be like a worthwhile route in my mind so they shouldn't have teased people with like trying to get them to go down that road and then realizing mm. their road is rubbish <laughs> Yeah, um, but but I think that would have actually probably caused just as much backlash from fans. So what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> Can't win. Yeah, yeah. I would have thought, hey, if I put enough in blood tinge, maybe I can use this Gatling gun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which and yeah. sadly nobody can fire that Gatling gun. <laughs> nope. Except for for Dura with his uh, special thumbprint. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like blade sword. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. His locking uh, mechanism. Um, like as you, 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 so you, you're, you're making your way back through here. Um, there's the regular beast patient uh, who can see you and thus are scared of uh, fire. <laughs> and then the uh, the uh, uh, lady patients. What are they called? Uh, the female beast patients. Uh, yeah, like, fem- fem- female beast. I, that's pretty close. Yeah, and, and, um, and I wasn't I wasn't peeking under the carriage. I, I like that's from the guide is where no, I pulled I, those I, from. I know you weren't like monocularing there. You were giving him a mon- <laughs> I wasn't, monocular pap smear. Like, I wasn't pulling a, pulling a Skyrim. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you weren't pulling a pulling a straight up pause in uh, Smash Brothers. <laughs> uh, creeper pause. But the um, I know I just the uh, so so th- and those uh, ladies cause poison and are not scared of fire. Yeah. Um, some kind of, of them make... do. Some of them have the ash blood, like the oh, the, yeah. the ones with the red eye. The, the red eye cause poison. So there's a little bit of variety depending on what specifically what like what specific strain they're infected with down here. And and ash blood is something we'll talk about a little bit. Um, which, as far as I can tell, is just poison. Mm-hmm. Um, it sound it has a more evocative name, but mm-hmm. it's just poison. Mm-hmm. Um, things that cure poison and things that add poison add the same effect. Mm-hmm. And like, um, there are all these kind of uh, statues here as well. Yeah. Um, these kind of chained up. Um, they look like they are like piles of statue being transported almost to me. Yeah. It looked like they were being gathered up and used as barricades because most of the ones that are chained up are actually placed up against walls. Yeah. Um, and I and, and Matt, I hadn't drawn that connection between the shrouds on the uh, on the female um, uh, beasts and the shrouds that are on these statues either. Oh, really? Oh, that's classic alien stuff, really, isn't it? <laughs> like, it's like just make the enemies look like the environments, and then that will really mess with your heads. Yeah. It is weird. I mean, there's I, I, there are parts of it where i can't work out and again i haven't finished the game so i haven't really had a chance to sit down and of course you know Valti video hasn't released his big video where he just explains everything it's on its way etc yeah. it's on its way i saw it being rendered today but um i i kind of think sometimes like um i can't help but feel that like it's just a bit well for example you've got like tons of statues and they're covered in shrouds and they're all chained up and it's weird and then you go to other areas and there's tons of statues and you just sort of think there's so many statues in this world. Like, <laughs> what was like the statue maker one of the, the biggest jobs? Was it like the most popular? To like the equivalent of being a truck driver in America? It's just this weird thing. Of, to begin with, I kind of started thinking, oh, mate, what's going on with this area? Like, why is there so many statues? What's the story behind that? And then after you find the fourth area that's full of statues, you think, there is no anything to this, is it? It's just cool. It just looks really cool having <laughs> like, statues everywhere. And it's the same with like, you know, you have like ridiculous amounts of of coffins and then ridiculous amounts of bodies all tied up in tarpaulin and like the top of it, you know, like mm. stuff. And you kind of think it gets to a point where you're like, I don't know, you can't work it out. It almost just becomes like scenery in a way, rather <laughs> than being like actually telling a story. It's, it's um, a statue based economy. It's what they yeah. have instead of dollars. It's like, um, it's like just that Island you, currency. Yeah. They, they just pull a, 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 a clutch of statues up to go pay mm-hmm. for their daily antidote. So somebody then, came down to Old Yarnum and bought something really bloody expensive. <laughs> yeah. Left like yeah, but, ten thousand statues. Yeah. It's all it's all the overflow from Sun's Fortress. <laughs> statue statue storage and spikes. But here's my question, guys, and let's spend seven episodes of follow up talking about this. Why are they chained? Oh, <laughs> let's do it. It's our classic move. <laughs> Wherever there's a chain, we'll be there. Yeah. No, I, I think it makes sense that they're being used yeah, as barricades. T- yeah, you could you could use the same adage that we use for mimics for our podcast, mm-hmm. where like chains within, treasure within, <laughs> chains without. Better watch out. <laughs> that applies to every individual episode. Um, you head down, you get this other little bit of, bit of dialogue before the actual big thing that happens here, which <laughs> is the, the minigun, mm-hmm. um, where he says, uh, "You know, you are adept, merciless, and uh, half cut with blood, as the best are, which is why I must stop you." And then <laughs> opens up on you, and like the most surprising moment for me, and like. Yeah. 
many, you know, one of the most surprising moments in any Souls game mm-hmm. for me. I was not expecting to have a minigun open up on me. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Did, did, did you guys end up getting uh, getting murdered by this right off the bat? Oh, God, yeah. No, no you, you made it past. You, you dodged it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. I just, I mean, I was pretty cautious. So as soon as I saw it, I just ran back and was like, oh, nope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and actually, it was, I didn't have that much trouble with this area. Um, I lucked out on my first, like, mad little rush. I found, like, a really cool shortcut. You can do a run and a leap, and then, like, it just cuts you through loads of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't too bad, but it did freak me out. I think uh, I was just... And I think, actually, you know, the, the whole... The whole... Uh, talking about the chains around stuff. I, I think that the barricade theory is interesting, actually. But I, I think also it just... It's one of those things where it's it's interesting to remember at this point when you first play the game, you don't really know what the game is doing. You mm-hmm. don't know what what the angle is. And at this point, it's kind of like peak werewolf, which is cool. That's the point where like, the werewolf stuff really feels like, wow, this is intense, but cool. But you don't know what else is up its sleeve. And so when you see all these statues covered up and you see statues chained up, you're like, are the statues going to come to life? Like, are the statues mm. going to move? <laughs> and I kind of think maybe that's what they're doing with the coffins as well. The fact that you've like all these coffins chained up, you're like, why are the coffins chained up? Like, are, are things going to come out of the coffins? And I kind of wonder mm. if part of that is just creating these questions that just keep you on edge of being like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Because <laughs> I honestly expected the statues to come to life. Like, mm-hmm. I was just like, they're gonna, one of the statues is just going to form me, I'm sure. <laughs> they, they didn't, but I was terrified of it. They, like, they, they might as well have, because, you know, in, in a similar way, like if a statue came to life on me, I, I would I would have died to it because I don't have a place in my head to put that. Yeah. Right? Like in, like in terms of like prior Souls experience, right? And so in context of the rest of the series, like the, you know, either, either that happening or this, you know, this Gatling gun opening up on you, like it just, I froze. <laughs> even, yeah. even though it tracks so, so slowly, like the, you know, like the, the, the two are kind of equivalent and it could have gone either way. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I died off the first bat just because I was so surprised, even though I, I was cautious. It was just literally the last thing I expected. Mm-hmm. After that, I didn't find this once I figured it out and it was like, oh, this is what you're doing. I didn't find this next area so hard, mm-hmm. kind of making your way from cover to cover, making your way down this building. Yeah. Um, they kind of, uh, you know, kind of double down by adding these little trap areas <laughs> in between um, that work against this, this cover. So there's uh, one area down a little bit further. Specifically, oh, yeah. that has exploding pops, <laughs> yeah. um, so you can't rush through if you've been doing that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, an ambush in the in the lower level, yeah, area where it just bursts out of the stairwell. Yeah, yeah, but and the two guys who were pretending to sleep behind you. Oh yeah, there. So that's always got me. Like it wasn't the giant uh, female patient. Mm-hmm. It was the uh, the two guys pretending to snooze. This gets incredibly linear right here, doesn't it? Like there, there, there are a couple of diversions you can take, and there's one where you jump out over the graveyard. But, like, you know, this little set piece right here, it's a little bit like a roller coaster running through these different kind of, like, uh, ventricles as you go along. Uh, I think it's really effective pacing, right? Like, I, yeah. was, I was, like, hungry for this kind of thing by this point in the game. It, it can be, yeah. The, uh, those shortcuts are, are the kind of thing that I felt discouraged to do on my first try. Mm-hmm. And then once I realized, like, oh, Dira's not actually that big a deal, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, could explore on my way down, um, you know, and actually hit all these little weird little shortcuts and side paths that you can do. Like, I didn't know there was a ladder down to the uh, the Hunter's Square mm-hmm. um, because I was so concerned with dodging gunfire um, until after I'd gone back through the area and I'd killed everybody. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, is, is that the is that the shortcut you're talking about? Kind of taking that flying leap off into the square. And no, there's one where like you kind of like there's the ladder going down to the square, and mm-hmm. then there's um right at that point if you just run because i did that thing of basically i was like shit run forward <laughs> and then saw how far the drop was mm-hmm. and then was like no i'm not leaping off that and so i immediately <laughs> just like took a 90 degree turn left and kept running and the woodwork on the floor like stretches out further like on right on the edge uh-huh. mm-hmm. and it basically creates kind of two planks of wood which just go if you just stay on the edge of down that crap you can run further and then take a leap from there and then you fall down basically like in i think you fall down like just before the room with all the exploding jars or something, oh, but yeah. basically it it allows you to skip like mm. a, a big chunk of like you know two or three little rooms of of like encounters. But yeah. even that, I love that as you say, it's the the momentum of of uh, it's that classic trick of like you know <laughs> you you you're like quick get inside and you get inside <laughs> and go there's a vampire in here oh! and then you run to the next <laughs> room and go there's a wolf ah! and it's just this thing of like you, you keep running away from one thing into something else. Um, and they just there's no safe points, and there is of course if you actually if you keep running, as is often the way with Bloodborne or any of these games, if you keep running, eventually <laughs> you will be fine. But um, 
you just keep running and getting your breath and going, oh, it's fine. Okay, it's fine. And as you say, I love the one too of, you know, having the, the large werewolf that you kind of think, oh God. And actually the problem is the little ones behind you and all that <laughs> stuff. And it's, it's just a, it's a little like gauntlet of horrible traps and tricks. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I love if you die here, you know, Jura, he kind of uh, taunts you a little bit. Like he is trying to teach you about the dangers of the hunt, right? You know, and, and he, you know, he's the first NPC, I think, um, who actually calls out like the nature of the dream. He says, if, you know, I should think you still dream, um, you know, before you come back here, think about what the hunt really means, right? Like he is disillusioned with this practice and is trying to kind of convince you as somebody he sees as a threat, somebody who is like, you know, to his eye, a die in the, a died in the wool hunter uh, to, you know, to think about what's going on here. Yeah. I mean, Eileen will talk about the dream, but if yet. you fight her, well, if you fight her, she oh, will. Okay, cool. But um, she, she doesn't naturally. So you can possibly, if you've done something really counterintuitive, you mm-hmm. can hear about another hunter who's experiencing the same thing that you, you yeah. are, um, or who have it has experience as it, mm-hmm. as it turns out. Yeah. But this is the first one who says it in natural kind of dialogue. Yeah. And uh, you know, just the idea that uh, these are hunters who stopped dreaming <laughs> And, uh, yeah, Eileen talks about, like, she actually admits that later on in her quest as well. Mm-hmm. But hunters who yeah. stop dreaming, like, knowing, like, this is my last go around. Yep. And we know why, how they got there, but that's a spoiler for, like, way later in the game. Yep. <laughs> um, we can surmise how they got to that point. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, so, you know, you head down either through, either way, either through the kind of cover-based corridors or you take kind of a wild leap down in this hunter's square. If you do get down to the hunter's square, um, you have a really tough encounter um, in front of a hunter fight while still being covered by a minigun, <laughs> um, which I think is is probably more than I, I can do. Um, every time I fought this guy, I've done it after I've dealt with Jura. Yeah. Um, just because uh, and there's can, not. Uh, you can. Uh, I, I killed him before yeah. I did Jura. I didn't know I could kill Jura. Good job, man. <laughs> you, have to, you have to be very canny about where you lure him to. Like, yeah, he, you just lure him down and you just keep getting to run and mm, game. It, he, he likes to, th- th- this is some great enemy I- AI because he likes to stick around in that square and kind of take cover in the in the smoke where you can't see him, but Jura can see you. Yeah. Yeah. So you got, where did you guys fight him when you fought him with, with Jura? Still active. You just have to kind of trick him down into that little side road yeah. where, uh, like by the, <laughs> by the shortcut. Oh, like he my, does that thing of basically he runs out of the square down to little steps uh, and then he does it. He does a thing of like he can slightly. I think the trick was he wouldn't really come any further than just the entrance to the square. But if you stand at the top of the steps, then what he will do is he will start his attack animations and then. But it means you dodge out the way and because he started swinging forwards, he would end up swinging forward usually then falling off the steps. And then he'd have to run around back up the steps to get back to his safe box. You know, yeah, and he's got that usually, leash. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then usually you kind of trick him by getting him to attack you, so he falls off the edge of it, and then you hit him a few times while he runs away. It's okay. a, a a dangerous trial and error because he is still actually a really dangerous enemy, and he did mm-hmm. kill me a couple of times. But it's like you can kind of cheese it very, very slowly. Yeah, oftentimes when I I tried to do that, I would get end up getting you know he'd get the the best of me, so I ended up waiting for the most part. But and I, I remember I saw you. it yeah. in the in the body video where you can actually push him outside of his leash. And then if he's outside, all he can do is run back. So you can just put yourself between him and his his leash, and he can just run into you, and you can just keep hitting him. But I, I didn't know about that at the time I, I fought this guy. Um, I decided to deal with Jura instead um, up these stairs, which is also a really, really tough fight. <laughs> um, if, if you fight him fairly. I mean, forget that, though. What's the point? <laughs> yeah. Like, It's set up for you. That, well, that, he, he's there. not fighting fair. Like, he's, he's know, shooting right? you with a minigun from, like, a mile away. I had a friend of mine who, uh, who was playing this, and he was like, oh, I'm about to go up the ladder and fight this guy. And I was like, he's like, what do I have to do? And I said, right, what you got to do is you've got to just keep shooting your gun at him until he falls off the edge. <laughs> and then and he does it, and then he replies back to me on, like, you know, chat or whatever, and he says, yeah, he just did it to me. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's what he'll do. But I like that because that's what happens to a lot of people is they step up the top of the ladder and they think, oh, it's a fight. And then they get shot and they fall off the cliff. And it's like, in a way, that's like, there you are. That's what you got to do. There's your tactic. You've just been given your inspiration but via death. Yeah. <laughs> after, like, after Father Gascoigne, I was thinking of this guy as a boss. Yep. 
Like I thought the entire this entire world was kind of his boss arena. And when you get up to him, I was going to get a title card that said who he was <laughs> and music. But you Instead still of fight him in that tiny out, arena. Yeah, like or I was like, oh, I thought that was the point. Like that was the mm-hmm. idea. Like, oh, you have to fight this guy in a very small arena. He's going to be built for that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but he just pulls out a gun and knocks you off the ladder um, in a, a lethal fall. You know, and uh, it was it was a real good moment when I died, and then I you know got to come back and do the same thing to him, um, and that was really really satisfying. Um, you can also, if you go up there and he actually manages to get away, eventually he will dodge himself off the cliff. Yeah, like he's so jumpy uh, <laughs> that he he will kill himself if you can dodge him long enough. If you don't do it the pure cheese way. I mean, I just yeah, I just thought him. It was just a mad. Like I was lucky in the fact that he didn't knock me off the cliff completely. He almost did straight away, mm-hmm. and I was like. My heart was just pounding around <laughs> my chest like a pinball, and it, I just managed to just hold my stuff together close enough, and then just got that window opportunity where he was near the edge and just pulled the trigger a couple of times, and that was it. Yeah. But I did feel <laughs> like, oh, I was not supposed to do that, but I like it. It's that, <laughs> it's that end of a classic Hollywood movie, that mad struggle. <laughs> where you, yeah. you never intend to throw anyone off a, off a building. That's the end of <laughs> Goldeneye, right? <laughs> Yeah, things just get a bit heated. It's <laughs> like how I, you're going to fall off a building. Sorry, you know, it's like. <laughs> I didn't feel bad about it, though. I think I've seen lots of chat online because, actually, I didn't know this guy's name. Uh, well, when you sent me over the notes for today, and you're like, oh, I'm talking about Jura. I'm like, well, who's Jura? <laughs> and, like, you know, Googled him. And I was like, oh, that guy. I just thought of him as the hunter with the gun. <laughs> and, um, yeah, like, I, I, I didn't feel bad at all. To read that there were people going, oh, well, of course, if you want to kill him properly, it's like, why would you? You'll fight a guy on the roof. Like, just he wants to knock you off the roof. Knock yeah. him off the roof. Like, that's fair. That's fine. <laughs> He's also like he's he's specced for this. Like he's geared up to fight in such a like a confined area. You know, yeah. he's got the stake driver on 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 there, which uh, looks like something from Assassin's Creed, right? Like you know, it's kind of like the guy who knows he's going to fight somebody in a, in a in a narrow hallway, so he uses a dagger or a short sword instead of something that has to you know swing and hit the walls. Like he mm-hmm. comes at you, and even in melee range, he is very very hard to deal with because this thing can take you down. He's he's fighting on exactly the ground that he would prefer for this. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that fight you, yeah. in uh, Berserk. Yeah. yeah. He um so there's a way to not fight him, mm-hmm. um, which I've never done. I've just seen online. Yeah. Um, because it involves avoiding this area and coming back way later. Yep. Um properly way later. You can actually go to it, you know, right away, but I think that's really hard. Um, which would be coming back after uh going through a different area and fighting mm-hmm. a boss uh that we're not gonna talk about just yet, um, to go in through the back way. And if you can get up to this guy without him spotting you. He will actually talk to you and be your buddy. Yeah. Um, I think this guy, I think this was supposed to be a covenant. Yep. I think this whole area was supposed to be like the forest uh, mm-hmm. where you were going to be a covenant where you protected this area from other hunters mm-hmm. and got summoned in before yeah. that got cut. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact that he gives you this the, this badge, the powder, co- the powder keg hunter badge. Um, which is this kind of heretic sect of the uh, of the of the church itself? People who are more kind of in tune with creating weapons and things like that actually makes me think that's what the covenant would be. Well, I the uh, he says specifically he says, "Will you vow not to hunt the beast right. of Old Yarnum?" And you say yes, and he won't he won't hurt you. But then if you go hit a beast when it attacks you, he will again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that being a thing that de-aggroed everybody, mm-hmm. like just like the you know talking to uh, uh, what's her head Alvana. Not, Alvana, yeah, no, I almost said sweet, sweet Shalkior. Um, different, <laughs> different diff. cat lady, yeah. Um, the cat lady in Dark Souls, like that's totally what I thought it was going to be. And then you would get, you'd buy like weapons from him, like high tech. Like this could have been where you got the cannon instead mm-hmm. of finding it, you know, kind of arbitrarily later. Yeah. Um, this really struck me as the first like bit of evidence, Exhibit A, of them scaling back covenants mm-hmm. um, to kind of an extreme degree. I don't know. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a really interesting theory, but I don't know. Because you get, the, I mean, the powder cake badge, you get that if you kill him as well. Like, that's just, yeah. it, in a way, you could argue the reverse of it being like, well, if you're not going to kill him, you still want to get that. So he'll just give it you, like, mm-hmm. as a way of, like, making sure that you get the weapons that you need and the way you get all the other badges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it, I can see it that way either. But a, a lot of times with NPCs and souls, if you don't do their quest properly, the way to get the reward is to kill them. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you don't uh, do... Uh, 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 Lucatiel's quest in uh, Dark Souls 2, like, if you want her armor anyway, you just murder her, you know? And, like, usually murder is the backup option, not the primary option for an NPC in, in Souls games. Yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking it'd be so hard to do that, though. It'd be like, mm-hmm. if they'd made it so he was a covenant, but you had to befriend him. and But the only way you could befriend him was by not going to this area and then later in the game finding the back entrance to it. 
because it's that it's a bit of a weird difficult thing of having like the kind of guy you kill at the end of the <laughs> tough area and the guy who was then you need to sign up with i don't know like I, maybe that was an idea at some point but yeah it feels like it was it's quite a messy like mechanical thing but it was a shame actually that we didn't have more like that i was really mm. hoping i mean there's there's a bit of that in a later area which you know people get summoned into and stuff but yeah, I, I would agree with you. Like, I, I think that like it is, it doesn't quite work as it is, but I think it was tinkered with. Yeah. Because like as as of now, you do this incredible difficult thing where you can talk to him. You get a little bit of dialogue, which is great if you're a lore hound. But the only actual reward you get is gestures, mm -hmm. and uh, that becomes kind of the like in this game kind of the default thing because there aren't as many you know weapons and armor in the yeah. game. Like I feel like gestures kind of become the default award, and. It does. I agree that it does seem kind of crazy to have such a difficult set of hoops to jump through and that rewarding you with a covenant. It also seems crazy to me to have like this incredibly difficult set of hoops to jump through and just getting a gesture yeah. for it. Yeah. Because it's so, you know, I guess that makes it more of an Easter egg. But I think that it was, it's in some stage of transition between the two. Like it wasn't made yeah. for, for either as it is. Maybe, nah. yeah. I kind of feel though as well that the, the games have got to this point now where like with this kind of game, they know the way people approach it and they know how much people are digging into it in terms of lore. That actually to us, it might seem like crazy to be like, well, if you're just getting a few lines of dialogue, but actually for some people that's huge. Yeah. And even, even if it was just something as simple as, and obviously people have discovered it, but if it was just something as simple as like, you know, if you first discover, oh, you can get to this area through the back, then I imagine that would make somebody think, hang on a minute. <laughs> what would happen if you came in from the back and he never saw you through the gun and like you went up there like and just maybe it is I mean I don't know it seems like you think oh it's a lot of work for an Easter egg but I don't know these guys love their plot based Easter eggs like being <laughs> like well if you do this then you do this then you do this then you get this little bit of conversation like uh, yeah compared to the ways you get into the other covenants like that's not that out of the realm of you no, know that's true, like that's how true. like how difficult or convoluted it is like think that's yeah, think true. about the dragon dragon in uh, Dark Souls one. Mm -hmm. The oh, dragon yeah. rose where you have to find, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 even, <laughs> or, or even, you know, the, the covenants in this game, you know, you know, like it's pretty complicated in some instances for a couple of them, you know, in terms of following people's quest lines through to the end. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Yeah. But, you know, his his dialogue is pretty much he doesn't reveal too much new to you. Right. It's still, you know, talking about how these people, you know, these beasts were once human and he had a change of heart. And now he is, again, like you said, Gary, at the beginning, the patron saint of this place. You know, yeah. it says, you know, one day you're going to see, you know, what's what's going the, on, the truth the, behind the hunt. Yeah, the hunt is a horrific thing, like mm -hmm. if you haven't figured it out. He says something like very close to that. Yeah. Uh, specifically, um, which is which is pretty cool mm -hmm. um, and, and pretty direct. But it does. It just ends up being like I've never done it. It seems barely worth it other than an Easter egg. But it's neat. Um, and it's neat. The, the powder keg guys are pretty interesting too. Like yeah. their, their flavor text is some of the most unsouls like in a hilarious way. If it ain't got a They're, kick, it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. <laughs> As they always say, if it ain't got that swing, um, it ain't worth a thing. The powder keg. I would have loved this covenant so much. Yeah. Yeah. I want them to all be I would like tunnel snakes. Like I want them all to have leather jackets. <laughs> like the powder kegs are just badass. Leather jackets, but they could still pop the collar. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, in either way, like whether you deal with this guy or not, um, you can also kind of do a secret way into this next area, the lower parish, this church we're going to be going into. Um, if you do a, uh, a, a, a secret way kind of through these rafters, you can get another, uh, messenger dress up item, which also mm -hmm. has fun flavor text to it. Yeah. Explaining yeah. that the messengers like to, like to dress up. They, uh, they like to mimic the patients, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, all of these messenger items say something along the lines of, oh, they're just kids. So let them play. Yeah, why not let them play as babes? <laughs> like, which I, I love that line yeah. as a as a thing for them. But really, we're we're going through this church here, which is really interesting, um, full of the the lady patients mm -hmm. for the most part. And when you get down here, you start hearing this moaning uh, that's <laughs> coming from the church. This like kind of chanting moaning, uh, which which is pretty interesting. And uh, and you make your way down, and you see there's a really kind of crazy awesome set piece yeah um in the middle of it um there's a guy who is going to be important in a, in a minute mm -hmm. um crucified yeah hung up by chains upside down taking up most of the vertical space in this cathedral too. yeah i don't hang on a minute i don't remember the set piece the uh in the in the church area the guy who's crucified down there uh, uh what in the big church with all of the werewolves in it uh-huh yeah I don't remember seeing a cut. Was it a cut scene, you say? Or was it just no, a, it's just uh, hanging up there. It's the, uh, it's the oh, blood no, okay. I, th I thought you meant when you said a set piece, I thought you meant it was like 
Yeah. Oh no, yeah, that, that's how I meant. I meant uh, uh, just that, it, like, it looks neat, like it's a, a thing, you know, a piece. It does of, look uh, neat, and I discovered it actually the first time by going via the rafters and oh, dropping yeah. a thing on it. So I kind of, I, I, I worried then that I'd miss something by doing mm. that because you can. Uh, there's a rope up there you can cut, which like drops a mm. bar. Mm, yeah. Flaming yeah. inferno. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. go, if you go in the sideway, you can actually uh, uh, encounter some of these, some of these female patients that are up in the, up in kind of the side wings. And if they, if they aggro on you, they'll actually screech, and that draws the worshippers up to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, blood, pungent blood vials mm-hmm. are, are really useful here because you're fighting a huge number, and you definitely want to take these guys somewhere where you can make them file in one by one, yeah. or at least two by two. Like get them into the stairwell. I found um, you could just basically go down there and Benny Hill. If you've done the thing that <laughs> I just talked about where you drop, you make the massive fire, the massive fire stays there. It's not a one-off. It's just a big fire in the middle of the room. And you just Benny Hill it around the fire and the wells just run through the fire a lot of the time and mm. kill themselves. I, I had never done that. So you drop some kind of brazier down there or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's basically when you go walking on the rafters. Yeah. It's not hmm. flagged very... It's one of those things. It's one of those real moments where you go... Can I do this? Is that <laughs> something I can do? Because it's like you, if you look and you sort of it looks like there's like chains holding up something, and you yeah. basically just you swing your sword, you hit it, and it chops and it falls, and then it's basically like a fire brazier or something. I don't know what it is, but I, I can't exactly remember to be honest. But it basically just then creates this massive fire in the middle of the room, like this massive pyre. Huh. It's really hmm. big, massive fire that fills the room. That's um, that's cool. Great. That's cool. I, yeah, I need to go it's, try that. It adds light as well, which is great. It means that that room becomes like less terrifying in terms of fire. But it means that if you're feeling confident, you can just run down there, dodge the attacks. And if you just keep running yeah. around the fire, lots of the smaller ones, they just keep clipping it. And mm. as long as you keep rolling and dodging, they just all kill themselves. Not all of them, but then you've only got like two or three left. And that's not really yeah. a problem. Hmm. It's kind of funny because the, the, those uh, beasts worshipping the, the, you know, the, the thing that's hanging there kind of reveals that they're not mindless. Yeah, perhaps right? we are the monsters after all. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, it definitely does. Like, uh-huh. they, they are. And the idea of why they are worshiping it is something I don't have an answer to. Right. Um, do, you, do you, Cole, do you have ideas? Or Matt, do you, do you guys have ideas why the werewolves are worshiping the, the blood starved beast hanging from a crucifix? Probably just not got a lot to do, have they? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the best I can come up with is like some kind of alpha worship. Like mm. this, like this is a fallen leader of some sort, or you know, they like they. This is still a church, and these are old parishioners, right? You can only assume that they're religious, and this is some kind of vestige um, where they're kind of remembering that this was important, but they don't quite remember what it once was. Wait, remember, yeah, it why? could be kind of yeah, like a Romero style, you know, the zombie thing. You know, they're yeah. just like yeah. they, they kind of have remnants of the. And actually, that kind of fits thematically with the idea that like um, of why the guy's protecting it. Maybe the fact that down here he's realized that they. They still hang around in the cathedral. Maybe that's mm-hmm. maybe that's the deal with the place. And he started realizing being a hunter down there that actually, why are they drawn there? I mean, this is purely like just speculation. <laughs> but it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There, there's a there's a bit in um, Epic Name Bro's video about this where he talks about when the Blood Star Beast was crucified here, or mm-hmm. this version of him. He was not a beast, oh, yeah. but he was a human and had transformed. Oh wow! Into that, but he never he is real coy about it without it actually explaining why or what that, that's, you know, to what end that's horrifying the idea that this is just a person who was infected crucified and as kind of like a last ditch effort did this transformation yeah but it wasn't yeah. enough huh yeah and it didn't actually save them and they weren't able to break free that is incredibly evocative yeah it's a cool idea yeah. for sure um so there's a, this little you know the set piece after you get past it um you get a bit of ritual blood mm-hmm. from the uh from the altar here which will become useful for the the actual reward of this area, which is not progress in the game necessarily. <laughs> um, I mean, it is, but through kind of a, a backwards way, we, we'd also be a little bit remiss not to mention before we get to the boss of this area. Um, did you, did Cole, did you find the, uh, the hidden kind of mansion to the left of the Hunter's square? You drop down. Uh, no, no, I didn't. So there's uh, in the Hunter's square. If you are facing the rest of old Yarnum and look to your left, there's an area you can drop down and go through a mansion huh. um, that has some kind of lore implications. Um, and I want to also mention it just so nobody calls us out for not mentioning it. Okay. Um, but you get the uh, the rifle spear here, hmm. and you get um, – there are those little lore notes, and they're all regretful. They're like this you know, this whole idea of like, oh, if if old if old Yarnum is, is lost to this, this plague, is there really no choice but to burn it all down? Mm-hmm. They have this kind of wistful tone to them. 
which kind of shows that it's possible that the powder kegs who, you know, the kind of leading lore theory, and it seems like they were the people responsible for, for setting this fire, um, maybe had second thoughts. And that could explain maybe why Jira is mm. here kind of stewarding this area that he had a hand in fucking up. Oh, I see. Like, so, so it's a little bit of a, I feel terrible about this. Haven't we done enough? I'm going to stay here and do penance. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So that, that, that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of, that's my current take on it based on what I've found there and then some stuff I've read. Yeah. Um, and that's the big, other than just getting the rifle spear item, which is supposed to be really good for a blood tinge build, which I've never played. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is uh, kind of the main thing of going through that mansion. Yeah. So I'd read about, you know, some lore notes uh, happening in this area, just in a couple of like summaries of things. Like I was looking up through all of what is the ashen blood, et cetera. Um, and uh, I, 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 you know, they, they were mentioning it and I'd never seen them. So it's good to know that this is where they're at and it's not some kind of vagary of insight. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's not it's not just a, a Easter egg. Um, so past the uh, the altar in the main area, we get into this lower parish mm-hmm. area, which is dark and spooky and full of werewolves from like the bridge. <laughs> um, ahead. Even though they're much easier to deal with now. Yeah. Like it's kind of nice to be able to fight these things with confidence mm-hmm. after uh, after having them fuck you over so thoroughly. Yeah. I love the idea that this is just a part of the city that sun never hits. It's so yeah. dark and kind of like has a, has a definite different character. Um, from everything else and like you know especially once we get to the to the very last part of this um it's lit entirely pretty much by burning bodies yeah which is which is super cool yeah which is new londo as fuck yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> um there's a shortcut here that'll go back up a tower mm-hmm. and let you into that area initially which will um i, I made good use of because i had a hard time with this boss yeah i'll admit it um but it's really <laughs> nice that's there because uh you know, otherwise that would be maddening yeah. to make and, that run every time. And, you know, the, the, the bonfire slash lamp, you know, theory or the way they treat it here is definitely in full force. There is one uh, bonfire that is outside of the area pretty much, right? Yeah. That, uh, you know, as you're going through, you're making these like ever widen, uh, ever widening circles that actually cut direct lines across each other. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, so you make your way through here, you fight some more werewolves and another uh, lady uh, patient. And uh, and get to this area, this kind of outside of this church, a mm-hmm. uh, church oh, of the good chalice. Incredible, incredible, um, like moment. Mm. I mean, it's yeah. just it's just some really artful, like uh, well, art direction. Just the the little pathway going down to the church, kind of dotted with you know, some beautiful uh, burning crucifixes. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's just it's just ominous as hell. It just has like boss written all over it, and it's great because I, I was really you can see it, you can see the boss through the door. It's like it's. I like that sometimes it surprises you, but I like it when it does this as well as being like, yeah. this is boss, you can see it. And it's especially because it's like, it doesn't look like a very big boss. You can just tell it's going to be trouble. <laughs> it's like, mm. it's either going to like explode in some sort of sprawling mess of tentacles that's massive or, or it's just going to be a dick. And it's a dick. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's a real dick. Is it small or far away? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, uh, the, the, when you, you bring up the, like, it screams boss fight, that's totally true because prior to this, like, I was kind of taken aback by the weird inversion of boss fogs mm-hmm. in the game. Like, the fact that, like, you don't go, like, the fog is only on subsequent times. You, you don't have that kind of, you know, signifier letting you know that there's a boss fight. So I was surprised by Father Gascoigne, um, and, and mildly surprised by the Cleric Beast and was surprised when I didn't find one for Jura. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, I, when I just seeing it, I was like, oh, this is a boss arena. Like, there's no way that this is not that. <laughs> um, even before I, I went in and actually saw the boss there. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of, uh, is it the only, this is the only NPC summon? Uh, no, you can entire... Father Gascoigne for a uh, for Oh, yeah, Cleric Father Beast, Gascoigne yeah. for Clear Beast. Yeah, it's the second one. And that one's pretty obscure. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of two NPC summons in the entire game yeah. um, where you can summon Alfred uh, if you'd like. And the way yeah. you do it is kind of weird. Like, there's a summon sign, but it... It blends in, yeah, in kind of a, a way. It just looks like a message here, and he's not actually that useful to uh, to fight this uh, the blood star beast. <laughs> Blood Star Beast. This is a wall for a lot of people. It is. Yeah. And I think actually a lot of people um, didn't get that. The thing was, when you play Dark Souls, uh, you, mm-hmm. you, I always said to people, like, you need to persevere. Because the thing is, Dark Souls always gives you options. It always gives you like two or three ways you can go. But really, you, it's, it, was so, it was so difficult consistently and such a like, so harsh consistently 
that you really, if you didn't focus, if you didn't just go, I'm going to do this and just spend the time and just focus and break it, then you'd never make any progress. Whereas the opposite is kind of true in Blood Bowl for me. It's like, if you hit a wall and you just think, whoa, this is way too hard, just go somewhere else. Like Because yeah. I found, like, I got to the Blood South Beast, I tried him once, he ruined me, and I just thought, nah, I'm not going to like... <laughs> And it may have been that partly because the load times in Bloodborne are a lot worse, but I just sort of thought, I'm not going to spend an afternoon dying to this 15 times. I'm going to go and do something else. And then when I came back, I was a bit higher level, and it wasn't that bad. It was still tricky, but uh-huh. it was much more manageable. Um, but I just love the, I love the build-up to it. I love the fact that, yeah, you're stuff in here going down, 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 down. And yeah. then when you see that church, you go, this is the end. This is the end of the path. Like, you can just After, tell. It's the fifth church I've been to, but I'm sure this is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> this must be the right church. I think we're late for the service now, but uh, <laughs> we should pop in anyway. Yeah. Elaine! <laughs> Elaine! This wait, is wait, Bouvier! Wait. Yeah, this is Bouvier. The, um, yeah, you're, it's like you're doing a church guide. Um, the I want to marry the werewolf. Um <laughs> Isn't that a movie? I married a the, werewolf. Uh, it's axe murderer. I'm sorry. The, man, the, the blood starved bride sounds awesome. Oh man, like that. That sounds really that's evocative <laughs> and awesome. Well, the the um so and and man, to my like not knowing this was optional uh-huh. after banging my head on it for so long was a real kick in the pants. Because <laughs> um, after I got my reward for fighting this, I was like not disappointed because I still felt really good about beating it mm-hmm. after many tries, but also just like. Huh, so this isn't opening up a new area to go to. That's nice. I'm fine with this. I mean, I not, really yeah, not a great area, area, but it's still there. Yeah. I was sure that that was going to do that as well. I was like, oh, Blood Star Beast will be the next like, bottleneck. I'll do that, and then something will happen. And then yeah. that's why I got really confused, because I was like, oh, I've got a chalice. I can do a chalice thing. Oh, a chalice thing. That must be the next thing. And then did chalice. I was like, is this even a thing? Like, is this? Yeah. I kind of got yeah. really confused doing the chalice. I'm like, is this part of the game? No, it doesn't feel like part of the game. <laughs> That's kind of crazy, too, because none of the bosses that you fight off of this hub give you a very obvious way to progress. No, yeah, yeah. you're right. Because yeah, if, uh, if you fight the vicar, mm-hmm. it, it does open something up, but it's not, it's not obvious in any way. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Is it not actually that Bloodstuff Beasts open a door in the cathedral? It does, but you can actually circumvent that as well. Yeah. So okay. like you can you can you can but there's a, a a key you can buy from the hunter's dream that'll get you through that. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. I yeah. thought it was a different door, but anyway. It, and it's very obscure. Like killing the Bloodstar Beast actually like r- progresses some some NPC quest lines in a way that is not directly obvious. But I can't exactly decide. I think it has an effect on, on Eileen and maybe one or two more that we've seen. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It is subtle, regardless. We should we, let's talk about the fight a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love the Bloodstar Beast appearance. Like this, yeah. uh, this feels like like a little bit like Resident Evil Five E a little bit, mostly because like it's hard to like your eyes kind of bounce off of her a little bit. I don't know why I say her um, or it or whatever, but uh, it's got these kind of like gigantic flaps hanging yeah. off it. Like this, it is exactly. pretty. It is, it, you know, it's it's on its way to becoming a different kind of beast that we'll see later. But uh, kind of all of the skin is kind of flensed off of it and hanging and kind of kind of like the uh, the cleric beast obscuring its silhouette and making it kind of hard to see what it's going to do. Yeah, yeah, this kind of shredded skin hanging off of a, a skeleton. It's this really, this really live thing that the fight reminds me of uh, Flame Lurker. Yeah, like that was the closest analog in, in Souls to me. Is this very kind of uh, you know not particularly strong physically but very live and very relentless fight that gets more relentless as the fight goes on ridiculously aggressive yeah yeah like just very very aggressive um you can you can parry you can stagger attack uh the the blood star beast um but it's a risky proposition a little bit because there are certain attacks that he, that uh, he or she does um that are e- much easier and other ones that are much much harder and it's kind of difficult to see the wind up mm-hmm. at least for me um, yeah. I ultimately end up did end up doing that quite a bit, um, and that usually would get me through the first half of the fight. And the second half of the fight, I think, is kind of some bullshit. A little, a little bit. bit, yeah, <laughs> just a little bit. Like it's not that bad, but like the the. So when she she eventually she rears up and becomes this poison spraying, like her blood, this ashen blood is literally spilling out of her as uh, this kind of this this poison mist. Definitely, yeah, like a mist. Yeah, and and so being near her will just kind of poison you at this point. And um, it seems like it's motivating motivating you to be more mobile, right? Like you can't just post up and try and ride behind her because you're just going to get this drain effect. But there's no, there's not much other recourse besides that. 
Well, even if you, so the poison builds up really quickly. If you spec yourself for poison resistance, like if you wear Father, Father Gascoigne's clothing mm -hmm. at this point, which is, has decent poison resistance, it'll slow it down a little bit. But like the problem with that, like I had no problem with, um, uh, with Smelter Demon, who like constantly sets you on fire. Like I don't mind like a status effect just being near a boss. Uh -huh. But the thing, the reason why this kind of bothered me was how ill-equipped I was to deal with it. Um, mostly because of the limit in the number of antidotes you can bring. Yeah. Um, you can bring, yeah, you can only bring 10 antidotes. Um, if you want, if you die to this guy and you have to go grind up souls for more, that's a real bummer. Um, mm -hmm. And even with 10, you know, once you kind of get down here, if you get poison on the way down, like it just doesn't feel like very many. Because um, I just, I always got poisoned very quick, even if I wore poison resistant clothing. Yeah. Um, so that part, that I didn't really like, and I would have been fine with it if I could have carried more antidotes, I think. Yeah. I think um, I got around it, this problem, actually. I didn't see the second stage because I wow. think I didn't, well, I wasn't well, like massively far ahead, but I'd, I'd gotten pretty boss at that point and mm -hmm. I was doing decent damage. So I think at the point at which it was transforming into its second stage, I just wailed on it. I just killed uh, it. Yeah. Like, yeah. so I actually think I skipped the last stage. I think I've done that with quite a few bosses, actually. I kind of just think, sort it, just go, just swing, 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 because I kind of know that when they get to the end, suddenly they change and they're nasty. Mm -hmm. But often when they're doing that nasty thing, it's like, now I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a good opportunity to get in some, get in yeah. some damage. But I, sure. do, I do love that kind of like, yeah, it, is, it is a bit like Resi Evil. It's almost a bit like John Carpenter's The Thing, though, as well. Just having something fast moving and weird that you don't really get a good look at. You know, yeah. it's, it's weird. You you don't know what it is. It's flappy. It's strange. And, yeah. And you want to like, you want to look at it. You want to see what you're fighting. You're like, it's... what the fuck is this? And yet you can't because there's not a moment of respite. There's not a moment of like just getting a good look at it. I'm going gonna, gonna to make this reference and Gary's head's going to explode, but it's like the leech um, enemies in Resident Evil uh, Zero. Oh. Yeah. Like yeah. the fact that they're kind of like they writhe so quickly as they move along. It's actually hard to determine what they are and where they're at. I do, you know, I, my dislike of Resident Evil Zero is not so much that my head explodes whenever it is mentioned. <laughs> like, I, I don't like Resident Evil Zero very much, but it's not. Like, it's, you don't see a doctor about that, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be difficult. As somebody who likes the series in general, but there's just one entry that literally just like, one? makes me apoplectic. That's that's about that's the one that I feel like is the closest to being good and therefore the most ah, disappointing. Okay. Like, Resident Evil Dead Aim, who gives a shit? Like, you can make fun of that all you want, but like, Zero, like, that could have been a good game, and yep. I just don't think it's very good. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, they are kind of like that yeah. in that respect, for sure. Um, <laughs> the uh, the nice thing, if you get Alfred here, the thing that he can do is distract him so you can heal and take antidotes. Yeah. Um, which is kind of nice, but he will just straight up die fairly, you know, pretty quickly mm -hmm. um, if you summon him and you're, you're here as soon as you can get here. Yeah. You know, if you don't come in kind of leveled. So it's not that... It's not that useful, yeah. uh, is what we were referring to. The arena actually makes it is really nice because you do have a lot of areas where you can kind of put pillars between you and him to give yourself a, an opportunity to heal. Um, near the end, when he just becomes this slavering, snapping monster that's oh. like almost impossible to escape, it takes a lot of work to do so, but you can. It's just if you make a mistake, you're likely to get kind of one shot comboed yeah. from it. Because this is a beast, you can actually um, you can soak it with oil and then kind of lure it into doing this large combo. Um, and at the end of this combo, it's technically in a staggered state. You can so you, you can actually hit it with a Molotov, and that's usually the way that I do it. It's a combination of that and um, and like parrying. It's relatively easy to parry this guy. Um, mm -hmm. So that's I didn't I didn't ace this boss the first time through, but you know I think that um, this was kind of the opposite of the vicar for me insofar as it was really difficult for a bunch of people, but for me it wasn't it wasn't too bad. Okay, are you, are you saying that because the vicar was really hard for you? No, the vicar wasn't that hard for me either. No, um, how is it? How is it the opposite? Uh, no, what I just mean like the like it was the opposite of the vicar for most people. I guess I misspoke. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I had I had a really hard time with both those bosses, but then my my bosses they had no problem with come later. The, uh, <laughs> honestly, the, the bosses exist. that I hit so much trouble but, with uh, come later. Yeah, yeah, probably possible. Yeah, the uh, but you know uh, Souls games find your find your weakest point and, mm -hmm. and exploit it. We so, all have a black bug room. Sometimes yeah, it's literally exactly. bugs. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes it's literally a beast. Um, the so it, you know he's really aggressive. You stay behind him, you kill him. Um, after you kill him, you get this, uh, the Thumeru Chalice, mm -hmm. um, which allows you to go into this, uh, this Tomb of the Gods. Yeah. Um, through Chalice Dungeons. Yeah. Thumeru, which is the, uh, the, the kind of city and civilization that was on the spot, uh, before. Yeah. Kind of the, the, er, and the, the source of everything yeah. that we'll, we'll find out the source of all this, uh, this misery. Yeah. Um, but for now that is, uh, that is 
Old Yarnum. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything, uh, any wrap up thoughts we have before we move on? I like Old Yarnum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I go out on a limb and say that. Say that <laughs> right. Pro, pro, pro Old Yarnum. It's yeah. great. It's, uh, I mean, you know, at least in the areas that we've covered so far, it's kind of unique in that it's kind of its own little, like, one-off. It's an appendix, right? Yeah. And it's a very self-contained story. Yeah, which I like a lot. Um, the uh, We didn't get in too much into why the idea of this, um, the source of this ashen blood um, comes through, because a lot of that is kind of speculation that is based on lore stuff we're going to talk about more in the future. Mm-hmm. But the kind of, the where I'm leaning on that and why I think is probably the most supported Theory is really cool. Yeah. And and it kind of makes this as its own little short story, but also the way it ties into characterization of, um, you know, the healing church and kind of these major players in the story of, of Yarnum as a whole is really cool. Yeah. And at the very least, like, I like it a lot from a gameplay perspective, um, but I also, from a lore perspective, that's my favorite part of it. Yeah. Is this kind of, you know, like I said, when I first got in the area, I was like, why did this happen to this place? <laughs> Um, that answer ends up being kind of, uh, you know, like a tooth, like it just kind of mm-hmm. keeps going. It's, it's got deep roots, you know, I just love it in terms of pacing and the fact that, uh, Bloodborne, you know, it's just, you're still really just, just dipping your toes into the game in many ways. Mm. And, you know, you've seen these weird white faced, uh, kind of keepers mm. in the cathedral ward and you've seen like some things, but still it's like almost exclusively like feral people and werewolves and it's all just like werewolf stuff and i love that this is like the last hurrah of that in a way mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but also you don't know that at the time and that's what i really like about it is it's just like you really feel like what's, you feel like you at this point i felt like i was coming so close to to finding out what the game was about you know mm-hmm. it was like it's like I've hit, like I say, I've hit peak werewolf. There's just loads of werewolves. It's ridiculous. You feel like you're moving down towards it. You feel like you're finding stuff out and you're not. And I just like that it's like, it, it, that's the point where I really felt like I was starting to get a measure for the game and the story in the world. And, you know, you're not even close, but I just love that. It, that for me felt like the kind of the peak of that, that part of the whole yeah. story curve. You know, yeah. you get to see the fruits of the, of the, of the healing church's labors kind of. Yeah. yeah. Well, if in like kind of version 1.0 of like your understanding, like yeah. I really like that as an idea because the the thing that I've, when people have, anyone I've, I've talked to has been like, I'm kind of into Bloodborne or like I'm kind of interested in Bloodborne, but like it just seems like a werewolf haunted house game. Yeah. And I had to be like, no, it's not about werewolves. <laughs> like, the, the, you know, the game, all of the marketing, everything led us to think it was about werewolves. It's not about werewolves. Yeah. And the, uh, this is kind of the climax of the game that was about werewolves. Yep. You know, before it actually. I, I love says, the. I We're love that trick. Yeah, I, love that. I didn't know that. I was like, this is a game about werewolves. <laughs> and then suddenly I'm like, oh, it's a game about werewolves. It's a really good way about werewolves. And it's just killing werewolves, but that's fine. That's fine. And then suddenly you like do other stuff and you're like, what the fuck is this game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still in that zone. I, mean, that's it. I yeah. haven't finished it and I'm still in the zone just going, what the fuck is this game? And I think <laughs> I'm starting to get the pieces to like really kind of work out what, what it's all about. But I just love that. And I love that this is for me was like yeah. the the peak of, of what I thought Bloodborne was. It's, yeah. Really. It's pretty funny because we're still working our way vertically, right? Like this is the very bottom of where we're going inside Yarnum itself. And things don't really start to get weird and, you know, uh, lose the werewolf, you know, the, the, the taint of werewolfism until we extend outwards. Right. And so we get the sense that this is very much a, a, a Yarnian concern. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this is kind of finding the very root of it. Well, I yeah. think that one of the one of the big themes of the game, personally, is that this this feeling of like it is that way. It's something you said earlier of like you know you you dig down to the bottom and then and then bring a shovel, and it's that that idea of like it's all about hidden things. It's all about things beneath, you know. And I, I like that. I like this idea that you really feel like oh we've drilled to the bottom of this. We've seen all of this, and it's like nah, actually mm-hmm. you're not. And it does that in a whole variety of ways. Sometimes it's just with shortcuts. This this way that it keeps bringing you back round to places in, in terms of geography that, that actually creates these amazing revelation moments of being like, oh my God, this is here. Like, <laughs> And it starts, you start to reassess not only going, oh cool, it's a shortcut, but you start to reassess the relationship of the world and the relationship of uh, the law and how it all ties together. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's just, it's incredibly smart, but I, I think this is a good example of like tricking you into thinking that you've you found something out, you know, it's very much the way that actually killing the boss is, is optional. It's a, it's a, a side thing. It gives you this sensation of having made progress and having discovered something. Well, actually, no, you haven't. 
<laughs> you haven't discovered anything. So something that and and to introduce like a, a a lore discussion thing this late in the episode is kind of weird. But I wonder, is there any legs to or what do you guys think of the idea? Um, what if uh, Dura is like this is kind of explicitly what he's protecting? You know, because like we we know he's protecting the beast. He says just as much, but he's positioned right before this church that leads down into this other church here. Um, where there is this like passageway to the labyrinth of the old gods, like a really dangerous uh, source of knowledge, kind of historically. Like there's just kind of this maybe I don't know if he knows it necessarily, but mm-hmm. the idea of placing this guardian before this thing that is literally Pandora's box, yeah, in in this game world is pretty interesting. Um, and it's it's kind of even more tragic if he doesn't know it. Yeah, I was going to ask is you know, and that theory is he's still acting as an agent of the church because he seems to be uh, pretty down on that particular organization. Yeah, he's not he's not a churchman. Yeah, by any means. Yeah, yeah. But 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 like you know he he's he still kind of kind of knows that there's something wrong down here and wants to keep people away from it, kind of for their own good and for also the the, the good of the world. Well, yeah. yeah, another theme that I'm not sure about because I, I haven't finished it, but I'm also getting the sense that a big theme in this game is this idea of of everyone playing a part in different ways, but everyone like the part you're playing perhaps is not your the part you're aware of, and it's just <laughs> like you don't get the sense that everything you're doing and everything everyone's been doing has all been a pawn in something much bigger, and you yeah. don't necessarily know what's going on with that. So maybe that rings true. And and Dura also kind of he serves that purpose for you, like he says, "Hey, think about what you're doing. Think about the role that hunters play in." Well, you know, we, I can't actually say what the what the larger game is, but you know, kind of actually alluding to the fact that hunters may be upon themselves. Yeah, yeah, very very interesting. Like it is a, it is a deceptively rich and dense area mm-hmm. for being an optional area, and the, and then that's part of why I like it so much. Mm-hmm. The um, so we were talking about the kind of uh, werewolf game, the kind of one of the turning points of that we're going to be dealing with in the next episode. Um, next episode, we're talking about the Cathedral Ward, and we're going to be uh, joined by Dave Klein, mm-hmm. um, you know, guest alum and uh, of the Dave Control Live YouTube channel, um, and Soul's been extraordinaire. Yeah. Uh, but for now, um, Matt, where can I, you know, thank you very much for, for joining us. Where can people find you online? Pleasure. I'm quite easy to find on the internet. Um, there aren't many other Matt Leases in the world. <laughs> um, so you can look for my name, Matt Lees. I've got a YouTube channel, which is called Matt Lees. Very simple. Um, I do actually do a series about Bloodborne, which is called Bloodborne Diaries. I recently put up a video, uh, which was an advert for Bergen Werther's Originals, which are <laughs> a, fictional, a fictional suite. If you haven't seen that advert already and you're a fan of Bloodborne, I guarantee you'll get a kick out of that. It's very <laughs> odd. Um, but I also do a bunch of stuff. To, uh, we've got the Dark Souls podcast, which is just about all sorts of games. And uh, I also just do, I do a whole bunch of stuff. But if you find any one of those, one of those things, then go and have a nibble around the other bits and you'll find something you like. Mm-hmm. Probably. You're you're probably uh, too 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 much of a gentleman to talk about it on the show, but I w- I would point people to patreoncom slash Matt Lees, yeah, where people sure. can support you directly. I tend to try and get people to look at my stuff first, but yeah. that's yeah, you can do that as well if you really <laughs> like my stuff, then you can you can find me. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think that that you will. There'll be something that for you to like. So yeah, um, again, really, you know, really appreciate your time, and uh, it's, been, nice to it's be been, been been a pleasure, Matt. Yes, it has. Yeah, so so Matt, we let Matt go um, due to time zone differences. It's quite a bit later uh, mm-hmm. where he's at, but uh, you know everything. We, you know, we 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 talked about this. I can't remember if it made it into the extra episode last episode, but every single time we have a guest, there's like <laughs> a minute of me and Cole being like, "What a nice guy! Like what what a, what a nice person that was!" Um, and it's happened with pretty much without fail. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't think of the, the a time it hasn't happened, except for Jeremy Greer, who's a piece of shit. <laughs> yep. Um, Horrible just, monster I, of a man. I, he keeps talking about shit about my cat on Twitter. Uh, so Jeremy <laughs> Greer, go fuck yourself. But Matt Lee, go fun yourself, because you're, you're a charming human being and really fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's to Gary's credit. The people don't, who don't know, like Gary is the one who, who kind of uh, aggressively pursues guests and kind of picks the lineup for that. And, uh, you know, Gary picks good people. And uh, we're we're incredibly happy with the way things are going. Yeah, well, thank you. And if and if uh, if, if you're listening again, if you have suggestions and stuff for people, I'm always open to suggestions. Mm-hmm. Some of which, uh, keep in mind, that I probably have tried, <laughs> uh, but I, I am interested in uh, in hearing suggestions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what uh, what can people do uh, to help us out, Cole? Well, um, I'm gonna pit, I'm gonna hit this because I realized yesterday we have over 900 Facebook likes, Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're rapidly approaching that thoudo. Yeah, let's let, let's hit that 1K. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once you once you get Thaudo Facebook likes, 
you, you feel better about yourself. Star next to your, <laughs> to your Facebook login. You feel like it's all worthwhile. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it is a fun. It is. It is does provide value. Mm -hmm. It's not just uh, providing EO for us because um, our people who listen to the show are very smart, mm -hmm. and we do our best, and they also do their best at aggregate uh, Souls content yeah. and have discussions there. And there have been long drawn out discussions there that I haven't really seen in other places. Mm -hmm. And they're also bringing together disparate corners of the internet um, to talk about this stuff. Yeah. So I, I learn from it regularly. As do I. Yeah. yeah. So that, it, it is a cool place to be. That is at facebook.com slash bonfire side chat. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I recommend that. Um, you can also, um, if you want to, you know, Matt has a Patreon. Um, you can also support us on Patreon if you'd like. It's uh, patreon.com forward slash duck feed TV. Mm -hmm. um, you can also, you know, listen to our other shows, send on over to duckfeed.tv forward slash tip jar or forward slash store. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of different ways to help us out financially if you'd like. Um, but if you, uh, if you don't want to spend that money, you know, join that Facebook group or telling a friend yeah. about the show makes a big difference. Yeah. Write about um, it on your blog, um, share it on Twitter. It's always wonderful when we look on Twitter and see people talking about the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. So, um, all, all really appreciated. And, uh, and we love you. Thank you yeah. for listening. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, any thoughts on the Cathedral Ward itself, up through Vicar Amelia, you can write those into duckfeed.tv slash contact. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, that's going to be, that's going to be a fun episode because mm -hmm. a lot of NPCs end up in the uh, Cathedral Ward. Yes, they do. So we're going to talk a lot about that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so until next time, what can they do, Cole? Well, you have the whole night to dream. So make the best of it. Umbasa. Umbasa. And we all pray that we will have far more soon. All right. Are you cool with me like rotating at that like that? Because pretty much every yeah. area that I've seen in the dialogue has something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Do not mind. Cool.